Welcome to the Bear Archery Podcast. I've got uh, an exciting episode, one I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've got Miss Christy Titus and her husband, Yogi, and we have a fun time. Yogi um, talks about his introduction into bow hunting um, and his start into bow hunting. Yogi's a longtime hunter, an international hunter, hunter, hunted all over all over the world in, in tons of different countries. But bow hunting was new to him, and so we kind of talk about what that journey looked like. Uh, we talk about some tips and things that he's learned along the way uh, as becoming a bow hunter. We talk about different international opportunities. We talk about some crazy fun stories. Guys, it's a really fun episode. Of course, we all know and love Christy. She's been on several times. Uh, but Yogi is just a really fun guy as well. And so we just have a fun time talking hunting, uh, talking some conservation problems in other countries, uh, as well as here in the U.S. But guys, it's a really fun episode. It's a really informative episode. We talk about some some beginner setups uh, for archery equipment to make things easier. Uh, we also talk about some setups for women uh, to make women with lower draw weights and shorter and shorter draw lengths more successful. And so, guys, it's a fun episode. It's a good episode. As always, it's brought to you by our good friends over at Scentlock. I hope you enjoy. With over 90 years of innovation, Bear Archery continues pushing toward the goal of founder, Fred Bear, making archery accessible for all. Fred believed the history of the bow and arrow were the history of mankind, and everyone should immerse themselves in the outdoor experience. Welcome to the Bear Archery Podcast, where the mission is simple, to hunt, grow, and inspire others. Guys, there's one fabric that if you're not wearing, you absolutely should be. It's a magic fabric. It changes everything about the way you layer, everything about the way you dress, everything about the way you hunt, and that is merino wool. I couldn't even begin to tell you all of the benefits of merino wool, and I'm going to miss some for sure. But guys, whether it's summer or whether it's winter, uh, this is going to keep you cool in the in the summer. It's moisture wicking. It's going to pull the moisture away from your body, but it's also going to hold your heat in the winter. It is antimicrobial. It doesn't smell. It doesn't hold scent like other fabrics does. So if you're out on a five-day hunt, you don't have access to a washer, this is not going to hold your scent. It's not going to to get stinky and nasty. Um, it's also, uh, quick drying. Um, you can hang this up in your tent. You can hang it up, uh, on a clothesline. It's going to dry really quick. But the coolest part about Merino, in my opinion, is that when it gets wet, it still maintains, it still maintains its warmth properties. So if there's a light rain or a snow and this gets wet, it's still going to keep me warm. There's no itch. There's it's, it's non-allergenic. It's an amazing, an amazing fabric. Minus 33. I, stumbled upon minus 33 by accident i was on backcountry.com and they were having a blowout sale i needed some new merino for a hunt that was coming up and so i i dove in i bought it and when i got it it was the softest best merino i have ever felt in my entire life i've not worn anything but minus 33 socks for everyday life whether i'm hunting hiking or just you know out for the day i haven't worn anything but minus 33 socks in over a year and a half Every single day I'm wearing their underwear. Every single time I'm out hunting, whether it's 100 or whether it's 5, I'm wearing some sort of beanie to cover up my chrome dome and to keep that covered up and warm uh, or cool Whether if it's in the summer. But also um, that UV protectant. I like to wear it in the summer. Um, guys, minus 33 does Merino, in my opinion, better than anybody else does it. Go check out minus 33 for all your Merino wool. And if you haven't ever tried Merino, Guys, you are missing out. It will change the way you layer. It will change the way you hunt. Go check out Marina Wool and go check out Minus 33. All right. So we've got Miss Christy and husband Yogi. Uh, Christy is obviously a familiar voice to the show. Uh, been on several times as well as uh, our 100th uh, episode, yeah. our 100th anniversary episode uh, with Christy and Miss Eichler, which was a fun episode. Uh, but now we have Yogi, and I am excited. Basically, I've wanted to do this podcast ever since, well, it's been a couple years now. Uh, Alec, when Alec was on board at Bear, he wanted this episode to happen, and, and it just always kind of just got pushed back. And so I'm excited that we're finally nailing it down and doing this. So uh, before we jump into all this, um, Yogi, give us an introduction to yourself, my friend. 
All right. Uh, yeah. So I'm from Europe originally. So born in Germany, half German, half Swedish. Um, and we've been married now for three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I run a booking agency guide service called JR Hunting. Um, that's what I mainly do. And then I tag along with Chrissy on a bunch of fun stuff. So is that how you met through like booking a hunt? And stuff? No, we met at the sheep, sheep show. show in Reno. Gotcha. The convention. Yeah. The wild sheep convention. And, uh, so I've been going to the shows in the U S for many years, just because of the business I'm in and the friends I have in the hunting industry. And right. we actually have a lot of mutual friends from way back that we didn't even know about, um, until we actually met and yeah. So that's how that happened in Reno one year. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I'm curious to to kind of dive into, and I love talking with people from different countries about kind of the the culture of hunting in the U.S. and just the commercial the commercialization of it, and you know the 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 industry itself. So growing up, was hunting really commercialized like it is? I mean, obviously, you guys are in the heart of the industry and making your living in the hunting industry. Um, how is that different from from the way you grew up with hunting? I think the industry and how it is commercialized over here is a lot bigger uh, than what it is like in Europe. I mean, there's obviously a lot of hunting in Europe and there's obviously a lot of hunting businesses, uh, rifles, bow uh, bow hunting is not that big, uh, but rifle manufacturers, ammo, gear, there's a lot of them coming out of Europe, but it's not the same as as it is over here. Um, And like I said, archery hunting is only allowed in certain countries in Europe. So I never grew up with it. Um, that's one main difference really? I can see. Well, Europeans um, also don't have access to the public lands that we have in yeah, the United right. States. It's, so it's a lot of um, private land hunting, uh, leasing, yeah. or you know, family estate hunting. And it's not something that everyone has access or opportunity right. to. But it's like, the same over here in certain states. You have way more private land Texas. than you have right. than you have public land. So it's kind of like those states in the US would be more comparable to Europe where you have private land lots of private land, leases, um, hunting clubs that you have to join to be be able to hunt on certain lands. Um, but you don't have the BLM or state land that you can access like you do over here. Yeah. So at what age? When did when did you start bow hunting? Like when did that start to oh. take place? When we got after we got married, yeah, I introduced her. him. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that yeah. recent, huh? Yeah, no. So it's only been like three years now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and obviously, I've never experienced it. The only home. bow he's ever shot is a bear bow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's nice. right. So, well, apart from like a kid's bow, yeah, know, yeah, but yeah. That's yeah. Not yeah. But no, so I introduced yeah. him to bow hunting after we got married because. Um, like he said, in Europe, bow hunting is very limited. And so um, he was able to get his first bow was a redemption EKO. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we practiced in our yard and he was like full, like Cameron Haynes, push up, sit ups, walking lunges, shoot my bow in the afternoon as he got his bronze on like in the yard mm-hmm. and like every day, twice a day. And it was really funny when he started shooting a bow at first, he was like 70 pounds and I'm like, you know, you might want to like turn that down. Cause these are new muscles you've never used. And like, work your way into 70 pounds and like after four days he's like i think i need to turn my bow down i learned learned that pretty quick yeah the little sore up here in my shoulder but he was shooting like two two or three times a day you know what i mean like obsessed with just all in on archery so because you you don't grow up with it you don't have the muscle memory and the the experience with it that you would have if you grew up with it from a young age, right? So I, I grew up with rifle hunting from when I was allowed to shoot and legally hunt in Europe, which was only 16 to 18 years of age is when you can start. It's changed now a little bit, but back when, when I started, I, I, I've been on hunts with my family and friends since I was five years old, like that I can remember. But just as a part of the hunting team, you know, um, pushing pushing the bush for for deer and, and moose. Um, but yeah, the archery hunting was totally new to me, and that's why I wanted to get into it, you know, that much because I I needed to, you know, gain 
on what you have had since you were young. No, 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 no. I didn't start shooting the bow till I was in my but, 20s. But still, yeah. you know, that's that's a lot of years yeah. that you have experience, and I, I don't have that. Yeah. So I just wanted to get as much of that every day as I could, you know, mm -hmm. shooting targets, shooting different angles, whatever, you know, and then... He was raised in Germany, and there's like a million people in his hometown. More, two. Two million people yeah. in his hometown. It was a huge city, yeah. and so for him to go hunting, yeah. he would have to go to his um, other um, country that he's a resident of, Sweden, where his family has some hunting ground. And yeah. so it wasn't like completely, it's not the same as it is in the United States as a kid when you have the opportunity to hunt when you're multi-country like that. Yeah. yeah, and we would only be in Sweden like for, during the hunting season, like a couple, couple weeks yeah. in the fall. And that's all I would have you know, being able to experience the hunting and being out in nature there. And then sometimes I could go with friends in Germany that had some hunting grounds outside of the city. You could go, but it was mainly small game, um, rabbits and, and fox and, and bird hunting. So, yeah. So do you still, do you still choose a rifle every once in a while? Or are you just like, man, this is the way to hunt now. Like I like no, both. I, yeah. I, I like to do both. Yeah. Um, it's just because it, the, the advantage you guys have here is with a different um, hunting equipment like archery, muzzleloader, rifle, you have the long seasons, right? You can you mm -hmm. can do different seasons for the same species, especially in Wyoming. You can you yeah. can start with an archery elk tag way early in the season, and then you can hunt all the way through to mid-November some places with a rifle on the same tag if you don't fill it. So I, I like to use both rifle and, and archery. You know, uh, archery is fun. I like it because... Getting close to the animal is neat, you know, experience sneaking in on them or calling them yeah. in. That's, that's a big part of the, the experience for me. What's been your, uh, what's been your favorite thing to bow hunt so far? Um, well, I haven't done a lot of it. I've done Turkey. Mm -hmm. I've hunted, bow hunted in Africa, but that was out of a blind mainly. Um, and then I've done elk. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, well, I've been on archery uh, whitetail hunts with you, sitting in the tree stand or in the blind. Um, but yeah, the elk doing the rut for sure. Very cool. You know, when you get big bulls fired up and coming in bugling, and that's and especially here where we hunt in the mountains, it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, what do you think it's going to take for archery seasons to be established in Germany? Oh, it, it in Germany they have archery hunting. In Sweden, they don't. So it, oh, okay. I, I think it is a political Sorry. thing. Like a lot of times with uh, stuff like this, because one of the main reasons they've, they've been saying in Sweden that why they won't allow archery hunting is because well, one, it's unethical. Two, it will increase poaching, which is, it's total BS because yeah. they allow silencers. So, I mean, what's the difference in shooting a silencer, uh, a silenced gun over a bow, you know? The right. poaching can be the same, right? So it's a political thing and they're lobbying for it. So they've been lobbying for a few years. So I don't know how easy it's going to be to change it. So, right. I don't know. So that is something to where <clears throat> I'll never understand how with organizations in place, with organizations in place that collect data to show animals harvested and what equipment it was harvested with, I mean, I understand, you know, if you look back 70 years ago and the data wasn't there to prove that archery was a legitimate means of harvesting big game, but now there's so much data. There's so many mm -hmm. books that collect that, you know, each state has their book. You've got Pope and Young, you've got Boone and Crockett that ask what the weapon was. And so it's so hard for me to wrap my head around how people would, would even fathom this is a, an illegitimate means of harvesting big game. Um, and so I think, well, I think I think we're fortunate in the United States that we had Fred Bear that fought so hard to ensure yeah. that archery um, was recognized in that capacity, because if it weren't for Fred Bear, archery would not be as widely accepted here as it is today. I mean, yeah. He really laid the foundation for that. And um, because even when archery began in the United States, as, as, as far as like, uh, you know, beyond you know, natives and original hunting backgrounds. Like when archery really became a sport and a means of take, there was a lot of people that pushed back on archery and Fred 
was instrumental in saying there's two types of hunting. There's archery hunting, and rifle hunting, and and he did not disparage rifle hunters, but also wanted to help ensure a place for archers. And, you know, that is relatively new in the United States as well. So, I mean, Europe's just behind. Well, I think, right. I mean, obviously, everywhere there was hunting, it started with bow, archery, or, or mm-hmm. hunting or spear hunting, you know, or traps. Um, but I think what might be one of the main factors in, in, in certain places in Europe is that the, the rifle companies, the gun manufacturers are lobbying against it too, right? I don't know if that is the actual case, but it could be because they would lose maybe some market on it. You don't know. Um, but I think it's a lot of, there's politics involved for sure. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but that's, yeah, that's how it is. Now there was actually a poll taken and I don't know that, I don't know that they looked at other countries, but the NRA put out a, a study and it was called the book that it was, that it was all published. It was called how to talk about hunting. It's a phenomenal book. If you're in the industry, I think I you need to read like it. I have like 500 copies of it. <laughs> It's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, now, I would say it's very analytical. Like, it's not just yeah. something you want to sit and read. It's not a coffee book, you know, or, yeah. or a coffee table book to just read. But I think if you're in the industry uh, and you want to familiarize yourself with how to talk about hunting to people, I think it's a really good book to read. Um, yeah, it gives you a lot of talking points that are fact based yeah. and not emotion based. Right. Which is which is interesting to me. Uh, and the point I wanted to to make there is exactly what you just said that, you know, most people when polled was more okay for, in the non-hunting community was, was more okay with archery hunting than they were with rifle hunting because mm-hmm. of the limitations you're putting on yourself, because you're making it more difficult. You're giving the animal a, a more fair chance. And so it's just crazy to me when other countries say, no, 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 no. We like rifle hunting, but bow hunting, not so much. Um, yeah. Because you would think, I mean, based off of those, you know, emotions and okay, well, they're making it harder on themselves by using archery equipment. You would think that it would be more accepted than, than rifle hunting, but it's the opposite. And, and most countries, most countries, yeah. And there, I think there's other countries like, for example, Japan, I think yep. where they mainly allow archery hunting and shotguns, but no rifles. Right. And I mean, there's that side too, uh, that, you know, it's turned the other way. Um, and that, could be because Japan is so crowded in a small space. They don't want uh, long range rifles and stuff. People shooting in highly populated areas, which Germany is different. You can have rifles as many as you want, pretty much. And, you know, so that's very overpopulated too for the little space it is. So it's, yeah, it's all different in different countries. Like it is a little different in the different States here too. You know, I mean, you have different regulations in every state in the U S too, which, you kind of can look at every state here, like one of the countries in Europe, size-wise and population-wise. You know, um, so the populations in these countries are so congested, and there's mm-hmm. just such little access. Um, and that's even in the United States, access is the number one reason um, that people quit hunting or don't don't hunt. Um, it, even with the opportunity we have, you know, access is a t- deterrent here. In Europe, I mean, it has to be an incredible deterrent because there just is not the access that we have. And we think we have it rough and, <laughs> and, and people, you know, entering the woods and being out there. But we are so blessed. Mm-hmm. We're the most blessed country in the world, really. Yeah, very blessed with yeah. all the BLM and state land access you have. Yeah. And national forest. National forest. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 I really enjoy that because, like, here in Wyoming, I can just go take the truck out and go and drive to, even if it's an 80-acre chunk of of state or whatever it might be, I go and hike it if I want to and look for sheds or just, you know, have a good time for an afternoon. Yeah. So, and you can't do that in Europe. And there's some countries where there's some uh, national forest, national park land available that people can access. Uh, Obviously the national parks not for hunting, but um, you know, uh, most places in Europe are very overpopulated and, or everything is private land. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. So that was completely foreign to you. Like when you first started experiencing like public ground, that was just a kind of a foreign idea to you. It was at the beginning, but I got into it way before I met Christy and right. moved over here. I mean, I, uh, because I've been, I've been uh, guiding internationally uh, since 
2002. Uh, I've met a lot of clients, hunters from the U.S. that told me about that stuff. And I, I made good friends uh, in Nevada where they told me to put in for the, for, the, for the draw with the applications way back when already. So that's when I first learned about it. Because, you know, that whole system is built on people having access to BLM and, and public land when they draw a tag to go and hunt. Um, so I learned that way back when already, when I started building points in Nevada. This is 15 years ago now because that's yeah. how many sheep points I have right now. Yeah. So, so what is, um, what's your thoughts towards, and I just, again, I'm just curious to kind of dive into that a little bit, but what's your thoughts towards like the TV side of things? Like, I mean, do you, do you enjoy that process of like, and obviously you're married with it. It's part of your life now. So don't say anything that's going to get you in trouble. Um, but was like everything gets me in trouble. I don't know what you're talking about. I know what you mean, my friend. I know exactly. <laughs> what you mean. Listen, I told this story um, a couple episodes ago, so I don't need to dive too far into it. But I have a young man in my youth group, and um, he is a um, just a, a wild kid. We were sitting at dinner one night, and he says, "Hey, Chrissy, that's my wife's name. Hey, Chrissy, Dylan says he can say whatever he wants to about you on the podcast because you never listen." And so he says, blah, 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 and starts naming off all the stuff I've ever said that she shouldn't hear. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And so I definitely got in trouble, uh, like talking about her snoring and stuff. And so, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, so, yeah, like what was that? Obviously, you're just thrown into that world. I mean, was that kind of like a culture shock to you that like, hey. Um, well, in a ways, um, a little bit, I guess. Yeah, because, you know, when you're on a hunt, there's a camera in your face. Yeah. Pretty much all the time, which, you know, I just have to watch what I say, I guess. <laughs> Most times I'm pretty good. And, uh, but I've, because I was guiding internationally, I've, I had encountered some of that before. Uh, some of the hunts I guided in New Zealand and in Australia, we had TV shows come over and hunt with us. So I, yeah. I'd met other people from the U.S. hunting industry that way already. And, uh, um, so I, I, I kind of knew what it was about, but obviously, he, but you also film all of your own hunts. Well, yes, I filmed for ah. a lot of my clients. I filmed my own with my own little camera camcorder just because I wanted to have it for the client, but also for myself as marketing material and, and making YouTube videos and, and stuff like that for my own business, you know, in order gotcha. to promote the hunts that I would, you know, book, help people book uh, in other countries. So I, I kind of knew what it was about and how to, you know, do camera work. And obviously this is way more advanced and there's a lot of production that goes into it and a lot of equipment and, you know, all the retaking of different writing scenes, whatever walking scenes it might be, you know, the recreate. So it's, it's, but the biggest change has been when we go places and people know Christy. I mean, just one thing, we went down to Colorado for an elk hunt. We stopped, was it Colorado Springs? We're going for lunch in a res ra random restaurant. First guy that sits there, hey, you're Christy Titus. I'm like, oh, wow, there we go. You know, it's just like a random. And then we were sitting, this is another funny thing. We were sitting up in Bozeman with Jason Matzinger in a restaurant. Oh, and yeah. he's a local celebrity. The guy comes in from the table next door. Hey, Christy, how you doing? Doesn't even recognize Jason. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> poor jason <laughs> that's funny but you know that's the biggest change i think and then you know being at the conventions obviously i know a lot of people from different outfits and, and from this, different countries in the world uh but being at the show with christy is totally different because everybody knows her pretty much you know yeah and like you, you go anywhere well you can't really go anywhere because you don't get anywhere when people stop you you want to talk but, you know, that's how it goes. I shows, have a so. high octane mouth. And well, so that too. <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> Which actually, this so, is... This be is be careful what you I say, Yogi. Be years. careful what you say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my problem is not other people. My problem is me. <laughs> I don't shut up. Never met but a stranger, also, talk to anybody. Yeah, but I mean, like, I'm pretty... Like, when I come home, I'm kind of a shut-in. And mm. so when I go to these events, I expend a lot of my social energy. And then when I come home, I'm just, you I, know, I don't, that's something, that's something I wish. And my wife's starting to understand more of it because she came to, 
she came to the Pope and Young convention. She's going, um, well, by the time this airs, Oklahoma total archery challenge have already happened, but we leave for that on Thursday. She's coming with me. And so she's starting to understand more of it. Like, okay, when he goes to these events, like it's on your feet all day, it's talking all yeah. day to people. Um, so when he comes home, like no wonder he wants to just chill, chill. out. Um, because it, and it's, it's really easy to look at that and say, well, he's going on a fun work trip. Like, yeah, it's a fun, we have a blast, yeah. but it's still, yeah. you know, from 6am to midnight, right. you're just working and talking. Um, which is hard because you walk in and you know the kids want to play and have fun. But guys, you've probably heard the saying, if you don't use it, then you lose it. And the same is very true with your feet and your ankles. And you guys know I am a big proponent of prioritizing your feet. I want to take care of my feet when I'm on the mountain, when I'm in the woods with a good pair of boot and a good pair of socks. However, that ideology of prioritizing your feet, it starts way before you get on the mountain. I want to train my foot and my ankle to be strong. How do I do that? With the barefoot boot. This looks like something you've never seen before, but I introduce you to one of the best ways to strengthen your ankle and your foot. This right here is going to train your foot and your ankle to be strong. The barefoot boot. Guys, we have been taught all of our life that put your foot in a super cushioned shoe with a lot of, of cushioning and a lot of arch support. Why? Because it's comfortable. However, what that's doing is that's weakening your foot and your ankle because they're not being used the way that God intended them to be used. This right here goes way beyond being a zero drop shoe. This is a barefoot style boot, which is going to replicate being barefoot. In other words, I get to use my feet and my ankles the way that God intended them to be used, and I'm going to strengthen that foot and that ankle. Because guys, when we don't use our feet and our ankle, it's going to cause a lot of problems. It's going to cause our knees to hurt, our back to hurt. It's going to cause those tissues and those the way that that functions to break down. So this right here is a training method that I wear on a daily basis as I just go throughout my life to train that foot and that ankle. Now, am I going to strap these on and go on the mountains with them? No, but I'm going to wear these all year long to build that foot and that ankle to be stronger. So when I do put my foot in a high quality, you know, mountain boot, it's going to be stronger and more prepared for the mountain. Guys, these things are incredibly well built. They're incredibly well made. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about with, with your feet and your ankles, I would highly encourage you to go check out episode 188, where I am with Mr. Chris Duffin, the mad scientist himself, one of the co-founders of Barefoot Boots. He was also a world record deadlift setter and squat setter. He knows about the foot and the ankle, and we talk all about using that and strengthening that with something like a barefoot boot. So guys, go check out Barefoot Boots. That's B-E-A-R, just like Bear Archery. Barefoot Boots. You can go to the Barefoot Store barefoot dot store on the internet and you can even use code train wild in all caps to get a discount on your on your pair of barefoot boots or barefoot shoes but guys start prioritizing your feet and your ankle start strengthening that foot and that ankle so you can be happier and healthier on the mountain i'm interested yogi and christy you guys both have obviously hunted in in a ton of different countries um what have been some of your favorite experiences hunting in other countries that's more for you. I, I've not done as much international hunting. Well, yeah, but, but, you know, not like you. You've, you've still, been everywhere. You've still done more than the average, though. I mean, I would say. Yeah, but not compared to him. Like, he's been to Kyrgyzstan and all, I mean, all these crazy places. Well, yeah, I've, I've, I've taken I clients to a lot of different places. I haven't, ha I haven't hunted myself in all those places, yeah. but I've been on hunts yeah. in a lot of places. Yes, and that's, that's when I started this business, when was it? In 2009? Yeah, 2009. I felt like I really, my two biggest hobbies were traveling and hunting, right? So I was like, if I can do something with those two things and make a business out of it, I'd be the best. Cause you, you really like what you do all the time, right? Which is a huge bonus, but also you never stop working really, you know? So it's, it's, up, it's the pros and cons of it, but I, I really enjoy it. And you meet so many great people in this industry and uh, you get to see a lot of cool places. I don't really have a favorite place. Um, every country is neat in its own way because there's a different culture, different hunting culture, different scenery, different food, all that stuff. 
is a big part of it, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I started this international hunting thing with the guiding and, and that in New Zealand. That's where I started doing it in 2002. So that's always going to have a big place in my heart for being one of the favorite places because it's so beautiful down there. Um, it's just so far away. That's the one thing. But uh, it's a beautiful place and um, beautiful mountains, beautiful people and uh, really good lamb. She doesn't like that, but I like the good lamb shops from New Zealand. And um, the other one is uh, British Columbia. I really like British Columbia because of the diversity of game and the beautiful mountain ranges and big, big hunting areas you have up there. Um, and obviously the U.S. I must say the U.S. is a big, big destination. And within the U.S., there's so many different local destinations in it for species, types of hunting, types of terrain. And it's just, I really enjoy the U.S., especially the western part of the U.S. because of the mountains. I really like mountain hunting and hiking yeah. in the mountains. And so that's one so of my favorite things. Yeah. With New Zealand, is it primarily like red stag? Is that what you're, you're guiding out there? What we were doing, yeah. So red stag and fallow buck um, and then tar and chamois in the mountains. And I really enjoyed those mountain hunts, obviously. Um, Very cool. The tar is a really cool animal. Um, looking at where it actually originates from in the Himalayan mountains in Nepal, where you have to be um, like way high, way, way higher than you hunt them anywhere in, in New Zealand, you know, for elevation. And it's a way tougher hunt. And it's like a 20-day hunt with acclimatization to the elevation and all that stuff um yeah so the mountain hunts in New Zealand were always cool but yeah red stag and fallow were the the ones that we that was the bulk part of the of the guiding yes so how um how many sheep have you gotten to be a part of not necessarily hunted yourself but guided been on the hunt with them um Don Marco Polo in Kyrgyzstan wow uh in combination with Ibex hunts over there. Um, we've, uh, what else have I done? Oh, we've sent the Dagestan Tur in Azerbaijan, which is, uh, do you know what a Dagestan Tur is? Yeah. yeah. So they, I think they actually considered a goat, mm. but they look like a sheep because they've got the, the curled yeah. horns. And then I've done some uh, exotic hunts in Texas for uh, Uriel sheep and for the Markor uh, goats. And then we've, uh, I've done mountain goat in, in BC. I don't have, I haven't done many sheep hunts. I mean, it's, it, when I started my business, a lot of my client base was out of Europe and they're not that interested in the North American sheep as much yeah. as you guys are over here. Um, especially with the pricing the way it is now, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah, most of the European clients would have been interested in doing the Ibex and, and, Kyrgyzstan and then maybe adding a Marco Polo, but that's also more of a US client thing to do the Marco Polo sheep. So what's what's one thing you've always wanted to be able to hunt or, or even just guide, but uh haven't had the chance to yet? Who haven't had a chance to yet? If Ugh. if you could go if you could go on any hunt tomorrow, I'm paying for it. Money's no object. Really? I, you 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 get to pick the hunt. What are you picking? I'd probably pick a big moose. But really just, i love big moose yeah <laughs> very cool have you ever got to kill one before yeah I, well i'm talking a 70 plus plus moose now it's like yeah the same thing i've killed a 51 inch bull which is a big bull yeah you know uh but i'm talking i wouldn't mind going on a on a big moose hunt like in the uh, northwest territories where now you are you going are you going gun or are you going bow if if money's no object you get to go on this hunt are you taking your bow or your gun can I take both? Sure. I I tried my bow. Yeah. Because I've guided but a lot. But you know what happens? You end up shooting with a gun. If you bring a gun yeah. as an option, oh, yeah. this is what happens, people. Well, <laughs> you have to yeah. commit. Yeah, no, you, if you really <laughs> had to kill it with a bow, yeah, you should only bring a bow. Yeah. But the thing is, if you have a 75-inch bow standing there and the own, like, and it's the last day of the hunt, and the only way to get to it is with a gun, then I would probably shoot it just because I would like to get that you know but yeah i mean i've guided i've guided enough moose in bc where um you know they they get pretty stupid in the rut so you can call them in close and we've had them almost run over the top of us like at five yards coming in hard to a cow yeah. call um but 
and the calling was hard there because it was the the bull to cow ratio was pretty even you know in other places like in the Yukon or the Northwest Territories where there's more uh, bulls and a limited number of cows if you throw out a cow call down a valley they'll run for miles to come to you you know so just depends yeah. on the area all right, it Christy, would be, that would be my dream hunt. I, and if I could do that every year, I would love to do a moose every year, if that's all I could yeah. do, because I just love big moose. What about you? One hunt, money's no object, you get to leave tomorrow, what are you chasing? Oh, boy, I don't know. Um, Turkey. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Because uh, turkeys are stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you know, brown bears on the height That's number one for my me. list. Coastal is, is brown bear. The, it's got to be coastal, though. I, that's yeah, actually, can, that's, that's a, actually what I like. Yeah. That's, and I only want to do it once, really, because I know it's going to be absolutely um, type two fun. <laughs> so um, it's it's a suck fest. I mean, a lot of people think brown bears is a big, glorious experience. But from what I understand, it's, it's a quite miserable hunt. Um, yep. But the accomplishment at the end of it, I think, would yeah. be extremely um, satisfactory. So. Good Lord. Did you guys see that bear killed by the Given Right TV guys? No. Oh my gosh. This is so this Recently? is the owner. Yes, just like two days ago. Uh so this is the owner of uh it would be Expedition Archery. Um yeah. but he I get a phone call uh and because of my position at because of my position at uh Pope and Young, I get this phone call at, from one of the guys and they say, Hey, um, we just killed a new potential world record. You get that phone call all the time and you're like, Okay, like whatever but then you see the pictures and you're like oh you might have just killed a new potential world record mm -hmm. this thing is absolutely i don't know if i can get it to focus no yeah, it's, it's blurry oh, oh yeah there it, it is oh yeah yeah oh wow look at the head on that thing just a tank of a bear yeah. um and you see photos like that and the the footage of it is just incredibly it's an it's insane footage and that's the type of footage that makes you go, I need to kill a coastal brown bear. Like yeah. I have to go on a coastal brown bear hunt. Yeah. So there's definitely what, like that iconic species list that I think, you know, everybody kind of would consider like a bucket list. And so, you know, people want to just once, just once, you know, yeah. that's kind yeah. of, yeah, that's that, one of them. That would be your top, top of the list too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Coastal yeah. brown bear for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking of lists, do, do either of you guys have any plans, uh, any desire to, to start marking off, you know, the 29 or even the deer species or, uh, you know, the finaz, anything? I mean, do, do you have any kind of I'm working desire? on sheep right now passively. Um, so I have a doll sheep. And then next year, 25, I've, um, I booked in for a fan and sheep, which would satisfy my stone. Um, if successful. And so then I can only hope or pray that I draw desert or bighorn. Um, so yeah. that's kind of one. Um, Unless he's paying for you next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. If you're waiting for me yeah. to pay, uh, you're not going to get to hunt much. <laughs> one of the, like one of the joys of living in Wyoming is that um, yeah. we have the opportunity to hunt so many species here and well within, you know, what I would call our home range, mm -hmm. um, which for me, has allowed me to kind of open up my hunt budget a little bit to um, try to save money for more of these like destination hunts. So like the sheep hunt I booked three years ago, um, so I planned four years in advance. So I booked the fan and sheep at the pricing for a doll sheep four years ago. And I mean, if you guys have been following sheep prices, it's a yeah, smoking deal. <laughs> By 2025 standard, it's going to be almost almost half probably. Mm -hmm the value. Um, so I think for a lot of people, um, you know, if you're like me and you don't have infinite resources is planning ahead with these outfitters, putting deposits down. And, you know, for me is, is just been, how can I accomplish some of these hunts that are important for me to have as an experience, um, and manage to do so, so financially. And, and so I've been just kind of chipping away at some of these opportunities in that capacity. Yeah. So, Yogi, as a as a booking agent, what what do you what do you say when somebody? Well, let's just say somebody's listening. Like, man, I really want to just try something new. Uh, I just want to hunt something different. Maybe it's a different country. Maybe it's a different species. 
what would you say budget wise and time wise, resource wise, what are some good options to look at? You know, what are some good options to say, Hey, this is not terribly expensive. You can get a tag, you know, flights, all that stuff. This is doable for some people. Um, what yeah. would you say would be to, to start looking at for some people? Well, obviously the budget is always the first question I ask people and they say, tell me right away what they want to spend. You kind of, <clears throat> because that narrows it down right away. And then if they're willing to travel internationally, that helps because yes, it opens up a lot more, but there's always good um, planes game packages in, in Southern Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, that are, I think that's one of the cheapest places in the world to hunt. For yeah. the number of animals you can take on, on a trip mm-hmm. uh, and how it is affordable and the service and the quality you get of accommodation and, and, and meals, and, meals and all that stuff is is pretty neat and it's so different from what you guys have over here or anybody in Europe has in terms of species and, and um, scenery and culture. If you were to take a $10,000 elk hunt, which is by today's standard, kind of a lower priced elk hunt, mm-hmm. and you were to take that same $10,000 budget for flights in South Africa, you could go and have a 10 day safari with five star dining and experience and lodging if you want that. Um, see iconic species that you've never seen and just have a completely different um, experience dollar for dollar uh, versus a five-day elk hunt. And you could probably take between five and ten animals depending on the animals you choose, you know, uh, in that budget. A lot of people think they can't afford to do a trip like that, but really they can. You can, and it's it's no problem. Uh, The other one I was thinking of is hunts that I do, for example, in Sweden, I do robot hunts. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a tiny deer species that you can find yeah. all over Europe. Um, but I, uh, I do them on the, the deer lease I have, which is my, my uncle's place, uncle's place in Sweden. Um, and they're very in, uh, inexpensive. Um, uh, you know, they're around at 2,500 bucks. But with the flights the, there and lodging and lodging meals included, and meals. but then obviously you have to add the flight onto yeah. that. But, um, and they're only like three day hunts. So time wise and budget wise, those are really affordable and it's also a totally new experience mm-hmm. in terms of yeah. culture and um, scenery so that's now another those, one i can recommend yeah are those incredibly hard to hunt like they just seem like even just looking at them you're like that that's got to be a difficult hunt like it's like a white-tailed deer yeah okay they, they're easy to pattern like we hunt them obviously it depends on where you are and how much hunting pressure they have uh but we're the least I have, we take four trophy bucks at the most a year, and it's 900 acres, right? So it's very limited hunting pressure. I'm very selective on age and everything. And you can pattern them depending on the time of year. But if you go post rut, which is what I like to do normally, it's easier to pattern them. They, you know, a couple of weeks post rut, the big bucks will come out again and just go and feed on the crop fields because it's uh, broken up uh, agricultural and timber. A country that we hunt and they come out and if you can pattern them to where they normally go feed they're going to be there every day yeah. every day almost at the same time so it's like a white-tailed deer hunt, and, and like on a physical scale of one to ten ten being the hardest it's like a one yeah it's, i mean anybody physically could go do and do the hunt um i like to do them spot and stalk <clears> but <throat> also with a mix of sitting at the field or at the meadow and depending on how you how much walking you want to do, which is not a lot anyway, mm-hmm. but you can just go sit. You can even drive out to the field. One could drop you off. You sit there, you know, yeah. and wait for the deer to come out. So it's, and it's a cool experience. They're tiny, they're tiny deer, but they're cool looking. And it's something totally different for people from the U S. Yeah. So, uh, was tree stand, did you do a lot of tree stand hunting growing up or was that just kind of like new as well? It's different tree stands than over here. So, it's more like a ladder stand is what you guys have over here is what we use uh, or like a tower blind. That's what gotcha. they have in Europe in most places. There's not like hang on tree stands or climber tree, tree stands like you have over here. That's that. Gotcha. He did I, his first climbing hunt with me for fair season. Yeah, that was it, <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> yeah. He was like, ah, <laughs> he got thrown weird. into the deep weird. end of the pool. Like first, hey, don't, first don't, time. Be, don't be laughing at him. He's fine. It's he like, did great. No, but I mean, it's like if you've never went up a tree in a climber the first time. Oh, you yeah. Go, he was sure. just, 
she was just like, if he falls and breaks his leg, he's just part of the bait, you know? That's how she's well, looking at it. Because I'm a sissy. Like, I attach the bottom part to the top part to where it's short enough to where if I drop the bottom part, like, I'm not going to die. Like, the bottom part's not going to go all the way to the yeah. bottom of the tree. And so he wasn't doing that. And I'm like, oh, you're so brave. Because I my, like, life fear is I'm going to drop that bottom part in. So I do these, like, micro steps up the, up the tree when I do the uh, climber. But, uh, yeah. So I was really – actually, I was very nervous having him do that because he did not have them attached. And I was sweating. I didn't it, like it. It worked out fine. Yeah, I'm fine. still here. Very Didn't cool. get a bear in that trip, though. I passed on one. Yeah, he's picky. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I was going to ask that. So – Inter- internationally is trophy hunting and the score antler size is that all as a as a big a deal as it is here or is that an, an american it, thing uh it, it depends on the country you're looking at but in europe in general it's age it's more age that matters over be. anything for management of deer is age the score um is not as important but you have to look at the, the main scoring system in Europe is the CIC scoring method. And they they have built in antler weight into the scoring system. Ah. So that's why age is important because the older an animal gets, the heavier normally the bases get. And there's more mass in the antlers. So that's why they get a bigger score. Um, so that that's their management philosophy. They, they base, base it on age. They want to leave the 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 big bucks to breed for as long as they can and then take them out when they go downhill when they start to go downhill and then obviously they take out younger deer um that are not um as that don't have the potential of you know being a, a trophy or anything that will uh improve the herd um but it, 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 the the scoring over here is a bigger thing yes when you talk in inches and like like we were talking about moose earlier, people throw out the 70 inch bowl, you know, thing, which it could be two points sticking out on the side of the palms, you know, that make the 70 inches, but then it has tiny skinny palms and doesn't really score well. So it, you know, it, you have to look at it in a different way for every species and for every country that, you, you know, you're talking about. And when his system. clients come here, like they're very age focused. Yeah. How old was my pronghorn? Yeah. How old was my mule deer? I mean, if you tell them they shot a three-year-old pronghorn because you can age them up to four with their teeth, um, they, they might be upset. Mm-hmm. Like they want to make which, sure that they harvested cool. something old. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very neat tradition that way because you obviously it, it makes sense to take out certain younger animals that don't have potential, you know, contributing anything to the to the, the herd or the population um so, but then another big thing in the in europe is you can you can harvest does or cows moose cows moose calves in sweden for example they have it broke down to where a lot of it is meat hunting too um just for management purposes um so yeah but the score thing is way bigger over here than it is in europe i think yes no, I, yeah, I think that's really cool. We went moose hunting over age. there, and they wanted me to harvest a calf moose, and I had a really hard time with that. I did not do it, but that was that was the quota. Like if we ran into or encountered a cow moose with a calf moose, I would have to harvest the calf. And I why is that? Oh, yeah. Well, they have a they get a quota issued by the uh, by the Fish and Game Authority over there depending on the size of the lease or the size of the property you have. And then they do moose counts in the winter and um, they, you know, they, they look at the droppings, they collect drop uh, moose scat and they just come up with a quota for you um, based on the population estimate. And um, then a big influence there is the timber companies because they, you know, they harvest, they take the timber out of, even of private land, you have contracts with the, the landowners to take timber out and they don't want to, the moose or even the red deer over there to to be too hard on the young trees because they go at the young trees pretty hard. So they, they have a big influence on what, you know, the, the quota should be and how the new moose number should be reduced every year or kept stable. So it, they've come up with a system where, you, you know, you need to take out, you can't just shoot bulls. You know, you take out some, some cows, uh, some calves. It's just, that's how it's always been. 
Yeah. Interesting. Because you would think mm-hmm. like, well, and this is maybe just my stupid way of thinking, but like, I don't know. Um, you would think if they have a chance at a cow or a calf and they're saying there's too many calves being dropped, then they would want to shoot the cow so that cow doesn't continue to drop calves every year. Right. Yeah, but, I think they they have a formula for it. I don't exactly yeah, know how no. they figure it out, but I mean, you know, they, which is, they probably, which is why we leave those decisions up to people who know how to make those decisions. Yeah, not, they, not there's me. a lot of research that goes into it, and um, I don't necessarily. I mean, like we we all preach for science based wildlife management. Hundred percent. Not always. Mm-hmm. People aren't always following science, right? Some of it's tradition. Some yeah. of it's. Well, I know, like a I culling said, effort in some capacity. Yeah. I mean, Sweden has one of the largest moose populations in the world. So to me, it's more of a kind of a culling effort. Um, Which that the forestry industry yeah. is a big part of that decision, like I said, because it, for them, it's income, right? Whatever the moose yeah. so. take take care of is loss of income, you know? Yeah. So right. there's always that mixed in. But yeah, it's it's a different system. And also it's because it it is mainly private land that is hunted over in Sweden it's a totally different management system than it is here on BLM. They right? also don't have so. the predation issues that we have in North America. In Sweden. Right. In some parts they're getting them though, because the wolves yeah. are coming back. Yeah, but really they don't have, they, I mean, it's not the same. Yeah. They don't have mountain lions over there. They don't have as many black bears. They, they have grizzly bears, but mm-hmm. not to, they just don't have the predation issues that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So, yeah. So you, you, you kind of have to control. Yeah. The other thing that's a big factor like in some places in the Midwest here and in, on the East Coast, is um, traffic accidents. If you know, if populations get too big, we had that issue in Sweden with the pigs recently because they they just blew up, you know, like wild pigs do. Um, and there was a lot of road accidents, wildlife accidents. So they, you know, that's another big factor that goes into the quotas and the management system. But one thing I can yeah. give Sweden credit for is, and I, I wish the United States did this, meat. is meat. No. And I, <laughs> I think it's really sad um, that so much wild p- pork, pig, yeah. is left to rot um, on the ground in mm-hmm. our country when there's so many people that are hungry. Mm-hmm. And in Europe, um, when we harvest a wild boar or a pig, we actually take a sample of the meat, we sent it in for trichnosis testing. Mm-hmm. Um, once that's cleared, you have the animal processed and it's all consumptive. Um, and so there isn't, um, you know, aerial, <laughs> you know, population control where someone's going up the helicopter and mm-hmm. shooting 300 pigs and letting them lie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I have no issue with that. I just wish there was some secondary effort that went in and yeah. said, okay, we're going to have a ground crew come clean this up and we're going to feed families. And that's they, that, they, that would be my dream, you know, yeah. to happen for they, for uh, they have an initiative in Sweden now too, where you can, that while, Wild game meat, any kind of wild game meat that's legally harvested in Sweden, you can sell to s- certain companies mm-hmm. that will um, um, take care of it and then offer it and sell it to supermarkets. Yeah. So in almost every big supermarket in Sweden, there's wild game meat packaged. That's uh, cool. They also eat horses, which we need to implement <clears throat> in the United States as well. I don't know. With, uh, culling and it's actually pretty horses. good. Yeah. No. Now there are because Christy, what you, what you just said is not only going to take away you know all these pigs that are just died died and left on the ground, but you know if we want to go back to that book, how to talk about hunting, you show people the full process and they're more right. they're more open to hunting, and mm-hmm. so by giving people ethically harvested, legally harvested meat yeah. to feed their families, you're going to start creating more of a okay maybe these people aren't all bad. Uh, maybe, maybe everything they do isn't bad. And so I I like that idea. Um, and and, you know, it's one of those things that too, we have so commercialized hog hunting that you're bringing them in from other places, trapping them, relocating them. The bait piles are disgusting. You know, we went Mm -hmm. to one place and they literally would pour diesel on the corn because it would keep deer away, but the pigs would still eat it. And so, and then you can't use the meat. You can't eat exactly. Them. So you're looking yeah. at this, and you're like, "All right, so I'm here Terrible. just to shoot pigs. Like, yeah. no other reason other than to shoot these pigs and let them lay, because you've soaked their food in diesel." Yeah. And it's just, but we again, we've made it so commercial that these guys can yes. have an abundance of hogs and make you know 250, 300 bucks a hog, and it costs mm-hmm. them nothing to feed them. Um, and so it's just like, 
Man. But they do. I mean, I understand they do a lot of crop damage and there needs to be good a management ton. with it. But also, um, I, I'm, I'm just an advocate for sustainable harvest. And that that's not just pigs. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for hunting feral horses. Like the United States needs to be hunting and culling these horses and mm-hmm. they need to be consumed by people. They're consumed by people throughout the world. We're the only country pretty much that doesn't have horses consumption. And it's crazy to me because the numbers are so beyond carrying capacity. Um, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's a vicious cycle in, yeah. in both cases with the horses and the pigs. I yeah. mean, the way that the pig helicopter shooting is done, for example, in Texas, and they just leave them late to rot. Then the other pigs that are left to survive, they will feed on those pigs, yeah. making that meat even worse to eat you know so it's just a vicious cycle that way yeah um with the horses they're really affecting wildlife right Mm -hmm. and you you put people are trying to protect and habitat and trying to protect horses and at the same time trying to to put money into wildlife and helping wildlife it's it doesn't make sense you have to you know you have to work on the whole loop and make it make it all work and the other thing if you could convince people and authorities in different states to help out with the like the harvest of pigs taking care of the meat having helping uh, landowners and ranchers instead of having to um, um, fund them when they have crop damage you know they get funds from from uh, from authorities help them with the pig control and then have them make some money on the, the the pig meat they sell for example and then feed people with it you get a healthier population too, in a way, in the long run, because they're eating wild game that's been feeding on crops and, and in the in the timber in the bush, you know, instead of farm raised cattle, for example, or or, or farm raised pigs, you know. Mm-hmm. So and there's there's if you look at the whole picture, there's you can make it a win win pretty pretty easy if everybody played along. <laughs> but we're just know, here solving politics. all of the world's problems, folks. Yeah, that's what we're here to do, guys. I'm not a gun guy. You're listening to the Bear Archery Podcast. I'm a bow hunter. I enjoy archery. However, guns are a necessity for outdoorsmen. I need an everyday carry pistol. I need a shotgun to shoot birds with. I need a truck gun. I need a gun to shoot coyotes with. I need a lightweight gun to pack in the mountains if I'm on a bear hunt and need backup. There are times where I need a gun. And I am the type of guy, like I said, I don't study guns. I don't know a lot about guns. So when I'm in need of a gun, I just call somebody. My favorite place on earth has become Powder and String Outfitters in Wellington, Kansas. I love the creaky old floor, the rustic decor, the fact that they just take you back to a time where Main Street shops were experts in their trade. It's it's one of the best feelings walking into that place because you feel like you're walking back in time. Powder and String Outfitters has just launched an online website where you can shop the largest selection of in-stock guns and ammo that you will find anywhere and the best prices guaranteed. Powderandstring.com. Guys, here's my favorite part. Call them. Ask them questions. Ask them, you know, tell them what you're looking for in a gun, what you want to get out of it, what you want to use it for, and they're going to point you in the right direction. How do I know that? Because I have to do that every time I need a new gun. So guys, go to powderandstring.com for your next gun, for your ammo, for your clips, for all of your hunting accessories, trail cameras, tree stands. They've got it all. They've got archery equipment too, but they are my gun experts that I trust, that I go to all of the time when I've got questions about guns, powderandstring.com. Go check them out. You can shop online. You can figure it all out. The guns will ship straight to your house. It's an incredibly easy process to go through. Guys, they've got everything you could ever need. Powderandstring.com. What's next for you guys this year? What What's your big hunts plan this year? Uh, well, my plan this year is just to stay as close as I can to Wyoming and hunt Wyoming. That's I'm saving my money for sheep next year. Um, I'll, I, I should draw Kansas this year, and I always hunt Missouri. Um for where white at, tail. Where at in Kansas do you hunt? Um, I don't remember. Uh, somewhere by unit 14. Southeast corner. 14. Unit 14. Okay. So oh. you can't be too far from me because I hunt in 13. Um, yeah. So anything adjoining 14 is yeah. where I typically put in force. So right now it's right here. It's turkey season yeah. and it's uh, spring bear. Spring bear. 
open today in certain units. Um, and then obviously antelope. antelope starting in August for archery. Um, then elk, deer. deer, mule deer and whitetail. Mm -hmm. um, we still have the fall black bear. We can use that tag on if we don't tag out in the spring. Um, there's always shed hunting this time of year, which I just did, which I really enjoy that sometimes going out, um, looking for sheds. And um, I might be doing some guiding in New Mexico, um, here in Wyoming and in Texas, maybe Colorado this year also alongside from hunting in Wyoming mainly. Um, but then obviously, you know, we have our name in the head for different draws and in different states so you never know i mean yeah, some I of them in, i put in for new mexico orcs and then deer yeah. so i don't think i'll draw the orcs but i have a i mean i could but i have a good chance of drawing deer and that would be a january yeah. 25 hunt so you know that might always throw like the plan plan around a little bit depending on if you draw and what you draw um yeah because if you draw a sheep tag you know then everything else is put on hold yeah I put in for Montana for deer this year, and then yeah, we might hunt Wisconsin whitetail in December. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So I mentioned uh, Oklahoma Total Archery Challenge. Are you guys hitting any of the Total Archery Challenges? Big Sky. Big Sky. So, guys, <laughs> go to Big Sky and find Christy and Yogi. Um, I don't know if Yogi will be there. It depends on his game schedule. That one is in June. Yeah. Right? June. Yeah, I might be in New Mexico then, but... I don't know until a uh, couple of weeks into May what the schedule is going to look like. So. so guys go find Christy and ask for Yogi. Um, and <laughs> if he's there, you'll find him. Um, it so will be live, whatever she says. <laughs> <laughs> bow setups. What are you guys currently shooting for bows? I have the persist. And I've got the execute 32. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So Yogi, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, um, not that I don't care about you, Christy, but uh, I'm interested. It's kind of what it sounds like. I'm second, I'm second rate citizen today. It's funny. Well, no, Can we do uh, split screen? <laughs> being a new bow hunter, uh, how do you run your setup? Like as far as sights, rest, uh, have you learned anything, you know, about archery equipment that you're like, you know, I wish every beginner should learn this immediately about archery equipment and, and you know, give that person um, that help before they get started. Yeah, so – what Christy mentioned at the beginning, don't try to overdo the poundage, mm -hmm. like at the beginning, like, especially if you're not used to it, you know, because it'll, it'll hurt you more than it'll help you because you will not get consistent on, on your shot placement. Um, uh, I'm using the react one digital react one single pin. Uh, I really like that, uh, set especially, how easy it is to dial in and how quick mm -hmm. it is to set up. Mm -hmm. um, you were both shooting single pin. Yeah. Uh, and obviously that's not legal in all states, the digital version, mm -hmm. but you have that one. And you have the yeah, regular reaction. The regular one. One, one that we also have that on. And uh, I don't know the rest. What is it I have on there? I can't remember. I've yeah. been torn. So what's your thoughts? Um, well, both of you, what's your thoughts on sites for a beginner? Because, I've went both ways. I'm like, well, with a single pin, they only have one thing to look at. You can't confuse them with different pins. Hey. But it's also another step in, all right, you've got to dial the site down to, you know, 27 or whatever it's at. Um, so I've been on both ends of that spectrum where, like, I'm like, you know, a three pin is the best thing to start with because there's nothing to mess with. You just pick your pin and shoot. But then I've been on the other side where I'm like, a single pin is the best thing to start with because you don't have to worry about picking a pin. You just, put the pin right on it and shoot. So what's your thoughts on that? Uh, Christy, why did you, why did you point him in the direction of a single pin and Yogi, you know, having been, you know, having, you know, recently started archery hunting, what would you say on, on the matter? So for me, I used to use multi pin sites and, um, Yogi was there one time I missed a deer hit like 20 yards and he's like, well, what pin did you use? And I'm like, well, all of them were on the deer. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, like, and so in the moment, sometimes when you have a white tail that's so close, mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to, um, not pick that pin and pick the spot when you have four mm -hmm. or five pins in your sight yeah. picture. The other issue for me is a lower poundage, lower draw weight. Yogi was with me on another deer I harvested, but he, when I ranged him, was at 30 yards. And then he took like five or 10 steps forward 
And I kept using that 30 yard pin and he was, you know, closer to that mid twenties. And because my bow is so slow, I have so much drop. Um, not that my bow is slow, but the combination of my draw poundage and draw length, um, that, uh, I, I shot the deer high. I mean, I, I harvested the deer, but it was a high shot and, um, you know, it just doesn't look good on camera when they drop like that. Um, and it's just not the shot anybody wants to to take. And so for me, a single pin, number one, allows me one focusing point. But then number two forces me to take that extra time to make sure that my sight is where it needs to be to make the shot. Because I think a lot of people start guessing, especially when you get into gapping pins. Mm -hmm. And when you're a novice and you draw back, And then you have all of these new things that aren't unconscious competence with archery. And then you have to add in, oh, I have to think about gapping in between 20 and 30 or 40 and 50. Mm, Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a technique for the novice. I think it is an advanced technique. And I think forcing someone to slow down, range, dial and shoot um, will number one, prevent a lot of misses and a lot of wounds and, and just really gives you that spot to aim anchor and focus Mm -hmm. and execute a perfect shot. And so for me, I only shoot single pin now because of that. Mm -hmm. And there's max point point blank theories like on elk, you know, Yogi knows we, we tested his bow with max point blank. He can sight in his bow and set his pin at like 40 yards and he can shoot down to like 25 yards or 20 yards and he'll hit high vital on an elk. And then with that 40 yard pin, and he can almost shoot 50 yards at low vital. And so there is that max point blank theory on a single pin. You can still implement on some species that are large um, and have it be very effective. You know, if you if you have a call setting where, you know, you don't have time to do that ranging, especially if you're in an elk situation, that max point blank is awesome. You know, you can set it and drive your bow and shoot. Or if you know, okay, this is closer, I might want to hold that 40 yard pin a little lower, then you're still avoiding gapping pins. Um, and, and I think it increases your success rate, yeah. which is I think- why I think the perfect bow sight in existence now is the swift duo, uh, because it's a single pin, you're going to dial yeah. right to where you want it, but it has that second reference point halfway down the pin. So if you find yourself in that situation where it's set to 40, yeah. And all of a sudden the elk's at 52, you know, yeah. where you still have a reference point halfway down your pin. Or if you're in a whitetail situation and you have it set for 27, um, then you know, well, if that deer, I still have a 32 reference, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the yeah. situation plays out to be, you have that second reference point. So uh, I'm so excited for the swift duo and for all the questions that we get asked, when will it be available? It's coming soon. Um I'm still waiting to get my hands on one. I was hoping to have it before this this weekend at Total yeah. Archery Challenge, but it is coming. So stay, and it's going to be cool. the yeah. best yeah, site that cool. Trophy Ridge has ever made, in my opinion. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, it is important, and I think less clutter is better. The other thing, like for me, um, that you know, there's this huge um, debate on arrow weight, and for me, um, you know, I sat down with Chuck Adams. He's great. He shoots for bear and. He um, was instrumental in saying, okay, well, Christy, let's figure out the heaviest arrow you can shoot. I should say, actually, I should word this, the lightest arrow you can shoot that's going to deliver 50 pounds of kinetic energy, which is that kind of gold standard number that trad archers used to shoot for. That's going to give you 50 pounds of energy so you can comfortably hunt elk um, and also give you the lightest arrow. So you have that speed so that if you're hunting a white tailed deer and it's at 20 or goes to 25, you don't have as much drop. And so for me sitting down and really implementing that and just figuring out what is that sweet spot where I have the energy I want for elk, but also will give me the most speed possible. Now for white tailed deer, you know, I don't need 50 pounds, but I, that's what I have. And so sometimes for white tailed deer, like, uh, you know, I'll run my bow for elk at 58 pounds of draw, but for white tailed deer, I'll drop it down to 50 because I'm trying to draw in cold conditions. So I'm not maybe getting that full 50 pounds, but for white tailed deer, we don't need that. Right. So, um, I'm trying to find that balance of my draw weight and arrow weight to give me the energy I needed for different species uh, without compromising as much speed. So what arrow weight did you land on? Um, oh boy. I'm, I don't even remember now. <laughs> you just put yeah, me in the high feet. 
<laughs> I'm trying to remember where I ended up on my uh, green sprint right now. Um, and I think I'm shooting my arrow and is 8.6, I believe. Okay. Green sprint, I think. Uh, and do I have my bow in here? I could look. It's in the truck. Uh, it's in the truck. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm shooting the Rampage 400, so. Gotcha. Yeah. That is something that, and I wish, you know, ladies, listen up, because I get that question a lot about low draw poundage, short draw links. Yeah. And I remember um, a few years ago, my wife hit a couple whitetails and just didn't get the penetration I needed. Yeah. And so I upped her arrow weight to like 520. And people are like, what are you yeah. doing, dude? She's shooting 47 pounds. You can't do that. And I'm like, why? I shoot 44 pounds out of my recurve. So her compound is still generating a lot more energy than my recurve because it's got cams and it's, you know, producing more energy. And I shoot like 620 out of that. So why can't she shoot this? And they were like, well, I guess that makes sense. And she just starts plowing through deer. I mean, just. I think I'm under 400 them. on mine, on my yeah. total weights under 400. It I just think starts it's plowing like, if, through. If memory serves, I was like that 390 range. Okay. Very cool. So Yogi back on the, on the single pin. Um, and, and sorry, we went down a rabbit hole, but, sorry. um, no, you're fine. I, that, that was a, a good, a good topic to talk about. Um, what have you, what have you come to decide about, you know, archery sites for beginners? I think my shot grouping improved when I went to the single pin. Oh, so you didn't start with a single pin. No, I had a seven pin. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's yeah, a big difference. Exactly. And I thought it was better to have that because, you know, I could get the yards on the on the higher pins, like out of 70 and stuff, and instead of having to guess and whatnot. But no, once I switched to that single pin, um, first the traditional one and then the digital one, I improved my my the roofing nice, a lot. The and, thing for him, we were able to chronograph it, and it's like point of aim, point of impact. So yeah. if he's standing at 52... He's not trying to gap a pin, right? He can just yeah. dial 52 and yeah. shoot it. It's just easier for him yeah. to not have to worry about gapping a pin or. No, I enjoy that single pin a lot more. And I think that new uh, one you were talking about with that extra, extra point, reference, there, point. reference point is going to be good improvement for, for that too. Um, and the thing that I like, the thing that I like about trophy ridges, uh, Swift you know, a lot of sites have that second reference point, but you pretty much yeah. have to figure out what it is. Um, yeah. Or it's only, you know, set if your pin's at 20, then you know that's 32. But because of Trophy Ridge and because of their React technology um, that they already have, they're going to have a second marker. So no matter where you put that top pin, you'll know the, what the second pin reference point yeah. is. And so yeah, that's awesome. I just think it's a beautifully designed site and I can't yeah. wait to shoot it. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing, like you mentioned earlier with the single pin, it, forces you to make sure that you know the yardage, right? You yeah. have to rearrange and maybe you have to redial your site. But if you have the time to rearrange, you should have time to redial, you know? That's and true, yeah. you're sure that you have Or have someone right? behind you, yeah. you know, like for me running a camera, um, my cameraman would kill me if I asked him to range. But, <laughs> um, yeah. but like if Yogi's with me and my cameraman and we're all together, you know, Yogi can range for yeah. me and give me a range and I can dial and, and you know, yeah, but it also one less step, right? Yeah. But it just depends on your archery team. Right. It know? depends on the setup too. I mean, yeah. and what kind of, if it's coming down, the animal's coming down the trail and you know you're going to try to shoot it, right? And this one on the trail, you can have the camera set up and everything yeah. and still range. But obviously, yes, you want to make sure you get the impact. If you're trying to video it. Yeah. 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 So Christy, what, uh, what, what big can they expect to see coming from you this year, uh, on the TV show, the podcast, what do you got coming out? Um, well, I'm still airing on pursuit channel. So last year I started airing on pursuit and then also on wild TV in Canada. So that will, you know, this year again, airing on pursuit and wild TV, I'm still on carbon TV, still digital. So once a month I release a digital episode, um, and podcast is bi-weekly, Wild and Uncut. And that's, uh, yeah, that that's still happening, you know, anywhere you stream podcasts. So the, e the episodes this year for Pursue the Wild are going to be different because we're incorporating lifestyle segments into every episode. So historically, it's just been kind of like whisper talk hunting. But now we're incorporating more of like life around my farm and the ranch and you know, kind that's of cool. the mules. The, a lot about the mules, you know. Um, so that's fun. Because we kind use of them change. a lot more 
now yeah. with being in Wyoming and having access to the mountains here and the and the BLM land that we can actually take the mules out for miles and get away from people more, which is nice. Mm-hmm. You know? And just explore. Yeah. This year, things. filming could be interesting. We have a lot of babies that have a lot of two, three two-year-olds we're going to be bringing. And then I've got three new mules, one that's seasoned, but two that aren't. So it could be a fun year for accidents and rodeos. Nice. <laughs> but last year we had some rodeos too. So uh, yeah, it's a little Western. I just took my mule for probably 35 miles in two days mm-hmm. looking for sheds. and He yeah. flipped him twice. What? Yeah. No, I the flipped. mule the mule fell twice. Okay, so let me elaborate on this. This is, <laughs> this is how this goes. She says something, and then people interpret it that way because she doesn't fill out the story, right? So the the first one, the first time he rolled off a little side hill, like we would go. There's really narrow canyons and little pointy sandy ridges that run down in, in this in this area. So we were kept, I needed to come off into the creek of one of those uh, pointy uh, ridges. And there, it was really sandy, soft sand, like kind of on a beach bank, you know. And I walked the trail. And there, there was not a big game trail, but there was a trail there. So I walked the trail. And the mule, Crude is his name, he must have stepped off the trail with his back leg. So he was under it. And he tried to get up on it, but the soft sand just made him not being able to, to launch up. So, and then he just decided, oh, well, this is too hard. So he just sat down kind of and started sliding. And I was like, oh, okay, he goes the lead rope. And he just did one roll and he was on the bottom already. It's not, it was not far. So it was like, he was fine. So I just slid down to him and then we walked out of it. Um, so it wasn't bad. I didn't roll him. He rolled himself. <laughs> um, the other time was not a flip on my part. It was a mud bog which uh, there's some of those. Uh, and he's he's been a pack mule up in BC for a long time, take, you know, hauling moose and sheep hunters and whatnot and hauling moose meat and everything. So he knows mud bogs. Uh, so we come in around one of these sharp pointy canyons into a, a spot on the trail where the main trail goes that we knew was wet. Yeah, last fall when we were in there, But we could go past it, right? And obviously this is pretty early in the spring still, so it was really wet, but I didn't know because I didn't come down the trail, the main trail on the way in, I had gone around it to look for sheds and other canyons. Coming back out, just when you come into that trail uh, in that little canyon, that's the first time you see how wet it is. So it was muddy and wet, like the whole thing was covered, you couldn't get around it. And by the time we got in there, it was too late. I tried to back him up and he bogged his back legs down and Luckily, the bank was high enough, so I just stepped off him. But then he, I tried to get him to, to back up. He wouldn't, and then he just, I think he reared up, but his back legs were stuck in the mud, and he just flipped over backwards onto the saddle. I'm glad he didn't break a leg, because if that thing, had, that might have been like more solid, he might have broken a leg. Yeah. So, and then he just laid there, and he was kind of on a downhill slope with his back pointing downwards, and so he was kind of wedged in between the saddle and the, and the bank. And I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> The, but this is why we use mules because yeah. they're so, and as bad as that sounds, it wasn't they, bad. they are fine. so much better in oh, the yeah. mountains than horses. And um, it, yeah. it, it sounded like, you know, he was like, cause we had a pretty big day. It was hot. It was like 75 to 80. Yes. Uh, two days ago. Mm. And we rode in the heat of the day and everything. He was exhausted already. Cause he has all his winter hair, you know? So. Yeah. yeah. And um, so he was, he just laid there. He was like, uh, he was groaning. I was like, okay, well, let me, t- so I took the saddle like loosen the saddle up and then try to pull him, you know, out. And he finally flipped over and stood up. He's fine. Yeah. Nothing wrong with him. He's so we got out of there. That's you know, he's funny. learning how um, real accidents happen very quickly. Yeah. Uh, very, very quickly. So there'll, there'll be lots of that stuff, I'm sure. Uh, there's a few fun accidents from last year that we got filmed and uh, one that wasn't so fun. And then... Um, yeah. Some funny ones with our rented pack wheels bucking and my horse I flipped last year was horrible. And so, yeah, there's lots of that stuff this year on the series. It's kind of new. It's going to be fun. Yeah. That's fun. All right, Yogi, where can they find um, your your booking agent? Where can they get a hold of you at? Uh, the website is uh, jrhunting.com. And then I'm on Instagram and Facebook under JR Hunting. Have you had anybody reach out and like, hey, I want to book a hunt, but I want to go hunting with Christy? Like, so <laughs> no. make it happen. 
Yeah, actually, it's happened. I always put those under spam. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> no, I see there's that. people that ask about it. There's people that ask about it, but it's not very common. We there. put groups together, yeah, though. Like, that, I mean, yeah. that's some of the stuff that we're doing more. Like, yeah. next year, we have a group going to New Zealand. And then we're working on, like, I have a women's whitetail camp this year I put together in Wyoming. And so I am putting together and more groups trips. and camps. And, oh, yeah, I have a women's pack trip I put together in July. Mm -hmm. So... And we're working on a donation with the Wild Sheep Foundation yeah. for the robot hunts in Sweden. Yeah. So I'm Very trying cool. to do more group hunting, uh, organized group hunting. So that's cool. That is very cool. One time I uh, and I know you got to go, so I'm gonna make I gotta this go. super quick. <laughs> I one love time, you, but I gotta go. <laughs> one time we had Lee and Tiffany on, and I said, Lee, what's one non-traditional hunting item that you always have with you when you're hunting? And he goes, Tiffany. And I had a buddy on with me, and he's super like sweet and kind didn't mean anything by it and he goes i could see why and he's like no i didn't mean like not nothing like that <laughs> i'm like you've already you've already put your foot in your mouth there, yeah buddy, don't so. dig the hole any deeper <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah guys i'm an arrow junkie i love arrows and i have found a fondness for deer crossing archery everybody makes a good arrow i'm not saying that anybody out there makes a bad arrow but what really sets deer crossing archery apart is when i call them I'm going to get, A, the owner on the phone. I'm going to get the guy that's building my arrows on the phone, and they're going to walk me through a complete custom build. They're not shipping me a box of arrows that they ship out to everybody. I'm going to pick my knot colors, my fletching colors, my wrap colors, the fletching configuration I want on the arrows. Not only that, I'm going to walk him through my setup. I'm going to walk him through what I'm looking to get out of the setup. I'm going to tell him total arrow length I want to be hitting, total arrow weight I want to be hitting, total uh, insert, outsert weight I want to be hitting, FOC, and he's going to custom build a set of arrows and send them to me. My arrows aren't going to be best for you. Your arrows aren't going to be best for me. We need custom arrows. Deer Crossing Archery builds those arrows custom for you, and they always perform. Their silencer shaft is my favorite arrow on planet Earth. I've shot 40-plus animals with that arrow. It always performs. It always blows through the animal. I always get great penetration. It's a micro-diameter shaft. They do have a full line of shafts. Uh, the new Rupture Arrow is a phenomenal arrow. I shot a deer with it this year in Missouri. I love their arrows. Guys, I would highly encourage you to check out Deer Crossing Archery because you don't have to go to a box store and buy a set of arrows that are just made from the factory you can get arrows custom made for you that are going to work best for you and your setup guys use code hunting 101 to get a discount at deer crossing archery i would highly encourage you to check them out they are phenomenal guys thank you so much for listening you guys know where to find christy go check go check out yogi uh, and his booking agent but thank you for listening you'll have a fantastic week thank, thank you. you very much for having us